Well, recently Dan Lanning was asked about the Alabama opening. I don't know that he was giving the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I absolutely loved it. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. So if you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. So if you want to read his comments in full, head over to 24-7 Sports. But Lanning was asked recently about whether he considered taking the Alabama job. He said, quote, the decision was made long before this. The season started long before I took this job. Oregon took a chance on me. I truly believe this is a job that we can make the best job in college football. Whoa. Whoa. And when you feel that way, then let's put some blood, sweat, and tears and sweat equity into making that job you think it can be. I'm living my dream. I'm in a place that I think we can accomplish every goal we want. I'll go into another section of his comments momentarily. I think he's being a little, you know, coach speak in there because anyone who interprets those comments as, see, never, never, never talked to Alabama. He never, never had any interest there. I have a hard time believing, even though I think he is being 100% sincere when he says that he can make Oregon into the best job, that might be a little hyperbolic, but that's why he can stay uh, as long as he likes. I have a hard time believing anybody would look at a phone call or an email or a contact in some form or fashion from the University of Alabama as a football coach and you'd just go, no, no thanks, not interested. I don't know how far it got. I have no idea if an offer was made. I know for certain that Dan Lanning was a top target for Alabama donors and boosters. I know that he was a betting favorite once upon a time with good reason because I, I, I know for a fact that people at Alabama wanted Dan Lanning, but Dan Lanning decided, nope, what I said about moving my family around, yeah, kind of meant that sort of stuff. And I think he did. And, and this is a guy who I think it's a perfectly fine, acceptable answer but anyone who's got in their mind, well, yeah, he just completely rejected Bam. Well, he turned him down, of course. That you know, the end result is what matters here. I don't think that Lanning never listened to him, didn't listen to an offer, never had a phone call or anything of the sort. He just ultimately landed on Oregon. But the line in there that makes me believe this guy really, really does love Oregon and wants to stay is number one, of course, that he is still the head coach. He could have been the Alabama head coach had he wanted to. He clearly does want to, and he's got everything that he needs to win at Oregon. Now it's about just going out and making that happen. But here's a guy who's saying, can't say that expression without thinking about Chris Collinsworth, but I truly believe this is a job that we can make the best job in college football. Now, That goes back to my cold open. Is that the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? No. No, it frankly is not. Is Oregon a top 10 job in college football? 100%. You cannot name 10 college football head coaching gigs you would rather have than the University of Oregon. However, can it be the best job in college football? No, it's just a reality. Geography cannot be changed. We cannot just saw off states and re or re um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm just going to go with a different one because that train of thought just absolutely went way, way off the rails there. Not in a bad way, but in a way that wasn't complete. You cannot saw off the state of Oregon and place it next to the state of Texas or place it in the state of Florida or in the state of Texas. You could fit Oregon in Texas. It's a very big state. Oregon is right on top of California, but it's not in California. So can Oregon ever be the best job? No. But here's why I highlight that particular quote from Lanning when I saw these comments come out. I want somebody who is projecting in a hyperbolic manner, perhaps, or an exaggerative manner, what he feels the job can be. I want somebody like Dan Campbell with the Lions who just believes down to his core that he can do it at that place. And I think Lanning believes that. 
And Lanning could win if he, you know, one day becomes the head coach of Georgia or Alabama. I think he's a really, really good coach. But he recognizes what we as Oregon fans know to be true as well. He's got everything he needs to win at Oregon. You just have to go out there and do it. And so when I read those comments and heard what he said, I thought, well, okay, that's that's not entirely the case here. But that's what I want to hear from Oregon's head coach. I want someone who thinks this can be the best job we we, we we want it to be. This can be the best job in all of college football. I want somebody who thinks like that. I want somebody who wants the fans to think like that. Even though it's not realistically attainable, that's what I want from uh, from my head coach. The next quote uh, sequence that I wanted to highlight was, quote, I made a commitment to players. You sit down and uh, and people see the commitment publicly, but they don't see when you sit down on a couch with a family and tell them that you're going to be here, what that looks like. I think normally that's generic coach speak, but with Lanning and, and his affirmative statement that he's staying with the Ducks, I think that carries a little bit more weight. So some coaches say that, and it doesn't necessarily mean anything. For me, that means something, and I'm committed to being here. I got a 10-year-old. I got to get him through high school, and the only way that doesn't happen is I don't win enough. Dan Lanning's got everything he needs to win at Oregon. That's a guy who knows how to win football games. We've seen that. He's only going to get better. The talent acquisition continues to be very, very good. And he can stay at Oregon as long as he likes. Because I I don't believe someone who in his first two seasons of college football ever being a head coach is 22-5 and five at Oregon, a place where there have been just two losing seasons since the turn of the century, I don't foresee Lanning flaming out. I, I it's it's hard to imagine when you recruit the wet. Now Texas A&M is of course the best example. Recruiting doesn't get you everything, but it can get you a lot. And they didn't have the right coach. They had the talent. They didn't have the right coach. I think Oregon's got both, and that's why Lanning and Oregon have potential. This is not a guarantee that Lanning is the coach 15 years from now with the Ducks, but clearly. Everything that we have seen so far should lead you to believe as an Oregon fan, yeah, this guy really does want to be here, and he's got everything that he needs to win. For 2024, turning the page a little bit here on the show, Jim Harbaugh left Michigan, which is good news for the Ducks. Michigan will not be as good next year. A number of other teams won't be. Oregon and Ohio State are the two favorites in the Big Ten for my money, and you can put them 1A, 1B in whatever order you like. Ohio State is very good. Oregon is also very good. Kenneth Grant and Mason Graham are two names to watch, follow, be aware of. There is no guarantee. So when a when a coach leaves, a team has the ability, every player on that team, to go into the transfer portal. And I just want to highlight this point because it gets brought up often when the college football calendar is discussed. A completely broken entity in the sport, it benefits nobody for no reason at any point in time. Well, it's got to align with the academic season. That's why you need the portal window in December, because then you could. But when a coach leaves, suddenly players can go in the transfer portal, even though it's the middle of the semester. It's almost like these matters and obstacles can easily be overcome. So as of now, Michigan has not seen a mass exodus because, and this is part of their thinking, hiring their offensive coordinator, Sharon Moore. He is providing a level of continuity, though a number of assistant coaches are going with Harbaugh uh, to coach in uh, the NFL. Jesse Minner, their defensive coordinator, their uh, associate head coach and head strength and conditioning coach as well has gone with him there. But Kenneth Grant and Mason Graham are the only players I've gotten questions before. Hey, could Oregon go after Michigan players? Those two guys. Those two guys I saw on a Wolverine site, you know, could potentially be players that go into the portal. They're defensive tackles. And I think for the transfer portal going into the spring window at this point in time, barring an injury in spring football, defensive tackle is the only spot that I can foresee Oregon being willing, able, or needing to bring in a transfer. They're already over the scholarship limit. There will be a lot more portal defections in the other direction for Oregon as time goes on, just to get back down to that 85 number, which they always do. They always will. There's no need to stress. A lot of people worry about that all the time. It always works itself out. There's an entire team of people to work on these sorts of things. Those would be a couple of names. Kenneth Grant, Mason Graham. If one of those guys goes into the portal, okay, now we raise our hand and say, should Oregon go and be after that guy? Other than that, I don't think there's a whole lot there. But Oregon could pick up a player in the 2024 slash 2026 cycle because of this Jim Harbaugh situation. Does that make any sense? I'll make it make sense. 
I can't make you go over to FanDuel. I'm just going to tell you that you should. Happy Super Bowl to all those who celebrate. Aren't we all stoked about the matchup? I'm not for various reasons. But FanDuel is still America's number one sports book, whether or not I like the Super Bowl matchup or not. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch. True. Grabbing your favorite football snacks, wings, and chips, and maybe a beer, and placing some super bets. That's 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 where you go when you want to make the big day the biggest day possible. And FanDuel's got so many ways for you to end the season with a W or two or three or seven or whatever you want. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers join today. You'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel dot com slash locked on make every moment more with FanDuel an official sportsbook partner of the NFL needed a big second segment sip today because earlier I had an intramural game I know you care and we won and I am very thirsty as a result because I played the whole game we were we only had six guys Let's get into the mailbag here. YouTube comments or X formerly known as Twitter at S McLaughlin CFB or at Locked on Ducks. DMs and mentions wide open on both handles over there. If you want priority access, go check out the flock over at the subtext community. Link in the description below wherever you listen to or watch this show. You can even, I heard this the other day, send voice messages on there if you do. And I like it. I just might play it here on the show. How about that? You could have your voice air on these very airwaves that we call Locked on Ducks. But you have to be a subscriber over at Subtext. Free 14-day trial. Then it's just $5 a month. All sorts of perks. This question from Brandon. Question for the mailbag. Would you consider Dan a defensive coach or offensive coach asking for a friend? The answer is neither. Spencer, what are you talking about? Dan Lanning was a defensive coordinator. He's obviously a defensive coach. Which side of the ball is he calling plays for? The answer is neither one. Dan Lanning has assumed a role which is referred to as a CEO head coach. He is overseeing the entire operation. He is involved with game planning on both sides of the ball. That's why you saw formations, concepts, and plays that were run under Kenny Dillingham also run this year. I will push back on this notion from now until the end of time. Just because Dan Lanning was a defensive coordinator, that does not mean he is having zero input on offense. It does not mean he's never talking to quarterbacks. That, that, is, that is a ridiculous assertion. Do you think Kirby Smart doesn't ever coach Carson Beck? Do you think Kirby Smart just says, hey, whoever my OC is, you need to tell Carson this. I'm not going to talk to him. I came from the defensive side of the ball. No, of course not. That's, that, that, that's ridiculous. When you come from that side of the ball, though, the most important hire is indeed your offensive coordinator. And I think Lanning's gone two for two on that particular front. But Lanning looks at Kirby Smart. He looks at Nick Saban. He looks at Jim Harbaugh as well. By the way, Ryan Day at Ohio State, he's not going to call plays anymore. Being a head coach in college encompasses so many responsibilities. Yes, Lanning was a defensive coordinator, but he's now the CEO and head coach of Oregon football. And that's the role that he saw with Kirby in Athens, with Saban in Tuscaloosa, and is seen around the country as well. There aren't a lot of college coaches that call plays. Why? Their responsibilities are are, are too multiple. I've talked uh, to to Southern Utah's head coach before about uh, about this sort of stuff. Um, I I, I do play-by-play for them, for those who don't know. And I asked him one time, you know, you, you, hey, you have a new offense coordinator coming in. Are you going to call the plays or is he going to call plays? No, he's going to call plays. Well, didn't you call plays at your last job? Yep. But when you're at the Division One level, you've got so many things on your plate. Play calling can be a distraction sometimes. And, you know, Lincoln Riley and Chip Kelly are kind of the only guys that call plays. But in the NFL, that's a lot more... That number is a lot bigger. There are a lot more guys who are head coaches that call plays. A lot of guys are hired specifically to call the plays, like Kyle Shanahan with the 49ers, Andy Reid with the Chiefs. They're going to battle it out in the Super Bowl once again. Why are those two guys hired to be head coaches of their respective teams? They're the play callers. They're, they're, They're directly in command on game day with this sort of stuff. The head coach still has influence, but it's very, very different in college, especially with the portal, NIL, and the roster, and everything like that. So that is my 
unexpected answer to the question, perhaps, is Dan Lanning a defensive or offensive coach? I mean, look at Nick Saban. You know, the identity of Alabama teams over the years have have shifted depending on what personnel they're able to acquire and, you know, what the landscape of college football looks like. They used to win, you know, 10 to 3 slugfests in the SEC. And then several years or a couple of years ago in Tennessee, they lost the game 52 to 49. Saban adapted. He didn't get left behind. He didn't say, no, we're only winning with defense. Like, you want to have as much balance as you can. And I think that's what Lanning is shooting for and what Oregon is also, you know, demonstrably attaining. I mean, they had a great defensive season to go, which I think will be even better next year, assuming the defensive line holds up. And the offense should be, I don't know, maybe five Maybe 5% not as productive because you don't have Bo Nix, but everything else, well, it looks looks like it's a full go there. So that's that question. Uh, this question came in from Bud. Bud asks, with Gatlin Bear going on a two-year mission beginning in February, is his upcoming commitment binding through 2026, or is he able to reevaluate and commit to a different school at that time if he so chooses? Bud also asks, with the Summer Olympics in Paris beginning in less than six months, which Oregon athletes do you anticipate to do well? I'll be completely honest with you. I don't watch the Olympics very much. I, I, there, you know, there's an event here and there, the, the world events where countries compete that I am drawn to, World Cup, basketball, gold medal golf, that's kind of it. Everything else, you know, if, if Phelps or Usain Bolt back in the day was racing, yeah, I'll watch. Or like Katie Ledecky swimming, like, yeah, I'll watch her kick everybody's butt. But like never been that big into the olympics like they're fine i don't know i have an issue with them it's just like yeah you give me a good tennis match i'll watch that in the olympics um if they have tennis at the olympics i don't actually remember if they do anyway back to the gatlin bear question so with gatlin bear going on a two-year mission he'll be the same as any other player right so he's class 2024 but he'll be on a two-year mission so he won't actually if he does commit to the ducks play for oregon until 2026 you you are correct along those lines now with jim harbaugh going to the nfl that could swing things in oregon's favor though that's not necessarily a lock this is the only really outstanding recruit there there could be tight end stuff we'll we'll talk about that later uh in, in the week so make sure you continue to tune in the show is daily of course and free and available on youtube or wherever you get your podcasts wherever you're listening to or watching right now i thank you for doing so there have been some rumblings about a potential tight end edition for 2024 i could see it I guess it's not, you know, the deepest position necessarily. You've got T. Ferg, Patrick Herbert, Kenyon Sadiq, and a couple freshmen coming in. Yeah, I, I, could, I could see him maybe adding one more. But I think for Gatlin Bear, you know, he'll commit to Oregon. He'll sign his national letter of intent. But then once you're on the mission, you know, he's not going to make any decision until he comes back. Like, I, I can't see him being, you know, on an LDS mission and then deciding, you know, Oregon's just not the school for me. I'm I'm going to decide to put my name in the transfer portal. He's going to be occupied with something else. He's He's got a different goal to accomplish whilst wherever he will be uh, placed in the world. So when he comes back, he'll be the same as any other scholarship player. He can decide to go in the transfer portal. He can decide to stay with the Ducks. And we'll just have to wait and see. But really talented kid, track guy. Never a bad place to go. Gatlin Bear, if you're listening to or watching this, just know it's Tracktown USA for a reason. It's Tracktown USA for a reason. So that, that could be, you know, another benefit of Jim Harbaugh going to going to Michigan. But, you know, as the Ducks go into the Big Ten, which is still weird. Doesn't it feel weird? Like it feels it feels weird and wrong, right? I'm not I'm not crazy here. I'm not, I'm not taking a bunch of crazy pills. I don't take any pills. I take Advil every now and then, which I'll probably need because I took a nasty knee to the thigh, which feels great. I'll take, one, I'll take a couple of those before I go to bed. I don't, I, don't, I don't do any other sorts of pills and whatnot, which is probably a good thing. Anyway, I'm getting off track. Oregon going to the Big Ten feels wrong because it is wrong. Like Oregon is going to play conference games at Purdue. They're going to play conference games against Michigan State. They're going to play Maryland. Maryland is going to go all the way from, you know, Maryland to Oregon. (laughs) Oh, it's so weird. It's weird and wild. 
But one of you asked me a question about who I'm excited to see Oregon play in the Big Ten. I'm excited about a couple of different things. Not all the things, but a couple of different things. First, though, we need to talk about Jace Medical, because I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of life, but can we just talk for a minute, just a minute, about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade, which is not what you would like to hear. I can't imagine more helpless feeling than needing a particular medication, not being able to get it. Luckily, Jace Medical is here to help. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial infections, illnesses rather, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, among others. Stuff could happen to any of us. You don't want to be caught unprepared. So visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board certified physician and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. It's a crazy world out there. Be ready for it. Go to jacemedical.com. Use offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. That's jacemedical.com. Offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. Tyler asks this question, which Big Ten opponent are you most excited to watch Oregon play and why? Also, how do you think Dylan Gabriel will adapt to the Oregon offense? Go Ducks. The second part of that question is a longer conversation. I'll share my brief thoughts here and continue to expand upon it as I let my thoughts marinate. I watch more film, talk to more people and all that sort of stuff for Oregon's new quarterback. But I think for Gabriel and the offense... It's a great fit because when you watch what Oklahoma did a season ago, they ran plenty of RPO with Jeff Levy at the helm. And Will Stein runs a lot of RPO. And and what Will Stein needs from a quarterback in his offense, and he's coached a lefty before, which I do think matters. Frank Harris at UTSA in 2022, left-handed quarterback, had a lot of success. So that won't be a problem for Will Stein It'll be weird to look at. It'll be the first Oregon lefty quarterback of my lifetime. And the first one that I remember was Kellen Clemens. And then you had, you know, Brady Leaf and Dennis Dixon, Justin Roper, Jeremiah Masoli and Darren Thomas. I'm not going to go through the entire list, though. That was a fun, brief trip down memory lane. I still remember Justin Roper throwing like five touchdowns in the Sun Bowl against South Florida and thinking to myself, that's Oregon's quarterback of the future. He wasn't, but it was fun to think that for a little while. He was six foot six and lanky as can be. Gabriel is someone who fits into this Oregon offense because he is not someone who has a bunch of size, a huge arm, or amazing speed. But guess what? He has a good arm. He has enough size. He has enough speed. And I think his ability to throw on the move, create plays, and extend them with his legs is is always a benefit to a team offensively. But when I think Dylan Gabriel and, and what we saw from him at Oklahoma, I think execution. And I think that that's what this Will Stein offense is about. I think it's a really good marriage because it's quarterback-friendly offense. It, it, it's someone in, in Will Stein who wants his quarterback to play within the structure of the offense and make the correct correct reads. He doesn't want him to go off script a ton. It's not based on, you know, scramble drill all the time. There are concepts that define reads and throws, and I think that that sets up well for Gabriel, who's not a huge guy in the pocket. You know, Bo Nix is 6'2", 6'3", 6'1", so, you know, somewhere in that range. Just sit next to him. He's a pretty tall guy. Gabriel's not that tall. Gabriel can kind of disappear in the pocket, but I think having an offense like this it, it is to his benefit. And I think Will Stein and and him are going to be a good match. As for the Big Ten, I'm not excited about the downfall of the Pac-12. I wish it would have stayed together for a litany of reasons. I love doing Locked On College Football. Uh, it's, 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 It's really, really fun. If you haven't listened or watched, by all means, go check it out on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm over there covering the biggest stories in what is the greatest sport on planet Earth, college football, five days a week, all year round. And that'll certainly be six with uh, reaction shows come the fall. I can't wait for football to get back already. There's only one football game. I know the the UFL is coming around, but I want college football. Love college football. In the Big Ten, which is, I'm I'm not going to get used to that. It's going to be even weirder when Michigan State comes to town for a conference game. But in the Big Ten, 
There are a couple teams that I'm excited for Oregon to play. Yeah, Ohio State's the obvious one. That's going to be a huge game, right? Huge opportunity. You could have game day in Eugene. You have a lot of eyeballs there. Sure, that's all good and fun. Oregon, Ohio State have played some, you know, pretty good games over the years. And of course, the Ducks got the better of the Buckeyes back in 2021 in Columbus. I'm sure Ohio State fans would like to get revenge. And Oregon fans, eh, a little less so. So that's the high level analysis you come to me here for. But beyond that, I think Penn State and, and Wisconsin are outstanding fan bases. I, I, I Those are the two that I look at and say, when Oregon goes to those locations, which they're going to do to Madison this year, they don't go uh, to Penn State up in, in Happy Valley, I think is what they refer to it as. But Oregon's uniforms against a Penn State wideout, that is, oh man, that could be some good stuff. I, I, I think that would look really good. And, and those environments are awesome. They're really awesome. They are big stadiums. They are great. Not good, great fan bases. They're really good programs. Those two stand out to me. You know, the Michigan game this year, yeah, obviously that's a big brand. But I, I'd say, aside from the obvious, Ohio State and Michigan, both of whom Oregon play this year, yeah, I, I think Wisconsin and Penn State are, are the fan bases, the teams, the programs that I'm most excited to look at and go, okay, this will be a fun, this will be a fun viewing experience uh, on TV. Good question. Last one here for today. Uh, back to Brandon. Question for the mailbag. What style of play would you prefer, an offensive-led team or a defensive-led team? Offensive identity, for example, Ohio State, not true, but I'll get to that in a sec. USC, Washington, Oregon of old. Those three are true. Or would you rather slow the offense down while the rushing attack dominate on defense like Georgia, Michigan, etc.? I just feel like if Oregon could win a natty with offense, they would have done it already. I'm looking at the defense under Dan Lanning to take us to the promised land. Thoughts? Ohio State's defense was great this year. Their offense was fine. Their offense with Kyle McCord at the helm was fine, but they replaced him with Will Howard, the Kansas State transfer, for a reason. Kyle McCord was not very good. And Ohio State's defense was nasty. And next year, guess what? It's going to be filthy. They have a bunch of guys coming back, and they added Caleb Downs, the five-star safety from Alabama. So I, I think Ohio State, they've kind of undergone an identity shift because they kind of tried the all-offense approach, and now they've gotten a little tougher and play, they're playing a little bit more defense. They came up short against Michigan last year, but you know those are the national champions. So I think that for the Ducks, you make an interesting, you raise an interesting point. If Oregon was going to win a natty with all offense, it would have done it already. I think that's true. I think that's true because 2010, the, the numbers that that team put up, not just on good teams, but on everybody else, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was bonkers. It was insane. And guess what? Even that team, 2010, played for a national championship against Auburn. Dyer was down from now until the end of time. You know who carried Oregon to that game and kept a minute till the very end? The defense. The <laughs> defense. Defense travels. Defense shows up. In big games, offenses can get tight. Go back and watch the highlights of that game. Darren Thomas was a little tight. He threw a couple picks. He was under pressure. He was rattled. He was a little tight. And Oregon wasn't able to run the football very well at all. And so I think that in 2014, you saw a bigger Oregon team that wasn't just based on speed to get to the edge. It, it was more physical. It had more NFL bodies on both sides uh, of the ball. And still, it wasn't enough. It was an offensively driven team. It was good enough to play for the national championship. And Ohio State was just better. When I think about Oregon, it doesn't mean that, you know, the identity of a Dan Lanning team that wins a national championship Sunday is going to look like Michigan this past year or is going to look like Georgia from a couple of years ago because how a season plays out changes every single year. How, it, how a team wins games changes every single year. So think about Georgia. Georgia had one of the most dominant defenses that Dan Lanning was the coordinator of. They won a national championship in, uh, in, in 2021. And, and then Lanning leaves after that national championship. They go and win another one. They had another great defense. They held TCU to seven points. That was an offensively driven team. That Georgia team beat Ohio State in the college football playoff semifinal because Utah beat USC in the Pac-12 championship game. This is 2022. 
the the final score of that game, I'm going to look it up real quick. Ohio State, because it was a high-scoring game, uh, 42-41. That was the final score. 42-41. That vaunted Georgia defense. They gave up 41 points. Ohio State was kicking a field goal from 50 yards to win the game. There, there, there's more than one way to build a championship team. But then Kirby's team turned around and they had big time offense and they held TCU to seven points. Seven points. Sometimes it can come down to the way you play on game day. But what I look for in a championship caliber team and why I felt Oregon had one this year and can have one again next season is that you have to be able to win in more than one way. You can't just win with offense or just win with defense. That TCU team ran into a Georgia buzzsaw like Oregon did to begin the year. Why? Why did TCU get blown out 65-7? to Because they didn't have a good enough defense. They had an offense that was really good. But if your offense has an off day, what's your counterpunch? It's great you got a 98-mile-an-hour fastball. But if they're catching up to it, what are you going to do? Got to have a slider. Doesn't mean you can't, you know, throw the fastball 70% of the time, but you got to have the slider. And so that's what I look for with Oregon teams. Offensive led, defensive led, I don't care. One side might be a little bit better than the other. Both have to be capable of winning you games and performing at a high level. And I think Oregon's got that going forward. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.